Right. Uh, okay. Good morning, everybody. It's me again. I'm back up here um, now in my other role as uh, the chair of this uh, this session on the Arab world. Um, so that for those of you that are more geographically minded like I am, you'll have noticed that we have been steadily moving east throughout the world, throughout the BRI. Uh, now for this session, we do a bit of a U-turn and head back west a little bit, back to the uh, Arab world. Uh, we have two fantastic papers, uh, one by Professor Wang Yuting from the American University of Sharjah, uh, and another by Associate Professor Jacqueline Armijo, Armijo, <laughs> uh, Armijo from the University of Hawaii at uh, Hilo, but also the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Uh, and after that, we will have comments from uh, Professor Nan Lai Kao uh, from City University of Hong Kong. Okay. Uh, the timing has been extended by 10 minutes, uh, according to the program, so we'll be finishing at around 12.40, okay? Um, so without further ado, please uh, put your hands together for Professor Wang Yuting, who'll be talking about Healing Ties, China's Health Silk Road and Traditional Chinese Medicine in the Arab Gulf. Okay. Uh, I think this is still morning. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you very much for um, to uh, David for this wonderful opportunity to, to be amongst this uh, group of um, wonderful scholars bringing so many different ideas together into this room. Um, I'm extremely privileged I mean, to present a paper that has been work, uh, in the making for a very long time. Um, this is a, a, a new, I, I, I still think it's very new field for me. Um, it talks about health. And, but I'm not trained as medical sociologist or medical anthropologist. And so there's something very exciting. And I've learned so much along the way um, as I conduct the field research interviews and start developing the framework and then to try to understand my data. And I continue um, working on data analysis and working on even the theoretical framing. So this is really preliminary and sharing some of the interesting findings from this research. And I really hope that I can get feedback from uh, you. Um, so, and then you'll see that then, you know, the uh, paper and then also my presentation is much more descriptive than analytical, and I apologize for that, but then I hope that, you know, the question and answer uh, following this presentation will generate some um, interesting thoughts and then for me to bring back to the UAE. So, um, well, um, let me begin uh, with a little bit uh, insight from a, a, a sociological and, and anthropological understanding of health, and it is well established that health uh, it's more than just absence of disease, and we not all know. Um, it is an intricate tapestry of personal experiences, cultural beliefs, social norms, and individual perceptions. At its core, uh, health embodies the values, traditions, and belief systems of society to which an individual belongs. And every society, based on its historical, geographical, and social cultural evolution, uh, develops into its own understanding of well-being and illness. Historically, both the Arabs and the Chinese civilizations have stood out as beacons of medical innovation and knowledge. Uh, the ancient Silk Road played a pivotal role in ensuring that these two rich traditions um, didn't remain isolated and this, uh, th this, this huge um, network of trade um, uh, active since the time of Han Dynasty um, was a conduit for a lot of cultural and scientific exchanges, and including medical knowledge. Um, now, the rise of medical, uh, Western medical science obviously changed the landscape quite a lot, and uh, it brought a lot of challenges to the traditional healing methods in the Arab world and in the Chinese world. Um, the methodology um, in, the, in, the, in the Western medicine overshadowed many of these traditional practices. Now, the domination of Western medicine wasn't completely uh, detrimental, interestingly. Um, while it did diminish uh, some of these uh, traditional exchanges between the Arab and the Chinese civilization, but in recent years, we started seeing um, growing interactions between the two regions, and the institutionalization of traditional medicine uh, also led the fusion of traditional and modern practices and enabled global collaborations and exchanges, and then which um, obviously uh, um, grew into something um, that we know as the health Silk Road. It is a modern extension of 
the ancient Silk Road, and it also operates under this much broader framework of Belt and Road Initiative. Okay, so just a little bit more about the health uh, Silk Road. Um, well, this concept or this initiative, um, however we wanted to refer to this, um, it, it aims to amplify health collaborations between countries, um, especially between China and then those countries along the historic Silk Road. Uh, its aspirations are, are not limited to simple medical uh, exchanges. Instead, it's, grand, it's, a, it's a grand endeavor to intertwine traditional and contemporary medical practices from varying regions, fostering a what we call a holistic, it's really important, holistic health care approach. And one of the cornerstone activities of this initiative is establishment and an enhancement of medical collaborations. Uh, this manifests in the form of shared expertise, research, technology, best practices between nations. And, and then in the heart of this um, cooperation is infrastructural development, of, uh, of course, which uh, is a, and the focus is on uh, constructing healthcare facilities, uh, ranging from hospitals, specialized research institutes in partnering countries, um, and beyond infrastructure, uh, health silk road also seek to play a role in um, the export and the distribution of medical equipment and medications, and China's emergence as a, uh, a producer of, of some of these goods, positions um, um, it, it as a critical supplier to nations under this initiative. And now, of course, we know that the COVID-19 has presented global challenge, but also in the midst of this um, chaos created by the pandemic, um, the significant um, uh, emergence prepare, uh, uh, the, the significance of emergency preparedness and the health uh, response um, had come to the fore and which also give China a chance to reconnect with um, many countries through what uh, we know as a mask diplomacy, especially you know in the in the in the earlier period of this time, um, and China uh, has built um, its uh, uh, medical exchanges with especially Italy and then countries in the Arab world uh, through providing PPE, testing kits, and vaccines, and um, so those are some of these backgrounds about um, the health Silk Road. Now. Uh, in, since the 1980s, China entered um, an era of reform, and the UAE, which is a very interesting um, and a strategically important location in the Arab um, um, Gulf region, also experienced a period of rapid economic growth. Um, the region's populace um, is a huge melting pot of cultures, ethnicities, and um, they come from different socioeconomic background. Um, there's a, a huge... Uh, uh, a hugely diverse um, uh, demographic. Um, they all have very unique health needs. And uh, a robust healthcare system, um, in fact, it's quite central to the uh, country's development um, vision. Um, now, this diversity means that the healthcare uh, providers need to be prepared for a wide range of medical conditions, some of which may be more prevalent in certain ethnic groups than others. More importantly, uh, Dubai, um, as a global hub of trade and transportation, uh, health of its residents also have direct impact on its productivity and overall economic performance. And this, you know, the importance of health um, um, cannot be emphasized uh, more. So the growing ties between China and then the UAE in the medical realm uh, in recent decades, um, I would say, uh, offer a fascinating insight into the multifaceted flows of goods, capital, and ideas beyond the conventional sectors of trade and commerce, which has been discussed quite a lot. Uh, indeed, from the 1980s onwards, there has been a uh, significant increase in the influx of medical um, resources from China into the Gulf countries. And the Chinese government began sending medical teams to the UAE in 1981. Um, that was before the formal establishment of diplomatic ties between these two countries. Um, and uh, the initiatives um, were not just about medical aid, as we know, um, they were also emblematic of China's growing economic stature in the world and its strengthening ties with the Arab world. So, um, 
well. Uh, I bring up two graphs, but I will explain in a little bit. Um, now the urban space okay, of the UAE um, is an interesting converging point of this multi-layered flows of medical resources and knowledge. Um, there's um, a very interesting um, dynamics going there. So let me just uh, briefly uh, walk you through some of these um, findings from um, a number of studies that I have conducted throughout the years. And this was a survey conducted in, in 2019, much bigger one than just about health, but we asked two questions about people's perception of Chinese traditional medicine. We can see that uh, there's actually, um, uh, no, even though people have not really tried, many people have not tried, but they do have a strong interest. And then this, you know, tell us something about um, the, uh, the, the market um, available in the region. And so um, now uh, very briefly, I wanna give you um, 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 a little bit taste of how the market looks like, okay? Uh, the UAE, um, in the UAE, um, based on our research, uh, both online and in the field, there are about 60 um, traditional Chinese medicine clinics operating in the market. Um, some of those has multiple branches in different cities, and most of them concentrate in Dubai. Um, I don't think my study actually challenges two stereotypes. Okay? Uh, one is that you know people often think traditional Chinese medicine operates you know um, as a private um, entity, private enterprise. Right? But there's also you know um, uh, some public support behind these medical enterprises in Dubai. And then a second, and it has to do with the ethnic sort of grounding of Chinese medicine. Um, now, uh, in my research, okay, I've seen. And um, uh, I, I've, I've interviewed okay, uh, one person who's very um, ambitious about his um, enterprise. And so what he uh, told me is that, you know, his goal is to really break the ethnic tie between traditional Chinese medicine with China, with Chinese. He's very, um, uh, um, you know, um, keen to push this global agenda. Um, he, uh, what he did um, was to convince an angel investor in China and to um, help him bring his Chinese medical clinic out of ethnic enclave. And he was very successful in pitching this idea to the partner in China. And he was able to build a clinic in the uh, an area um, of upper middle income residents. And then so that uh, integrates, you know, so to integrate his medical practices with the mainstream medical suppliers in the area. I have some interesting uh, 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 maps here um, because I do really want to emphasize on the spatial dimension. Um, as I mentioned, you know, this ethnic tie has always been very strong between Chinese traditional medicine and um, the, the Chinese ethnic um, neighborhoods, obviously. But here, this shows three maps. Uh, on this side, you know, I have this map of Dubai, and the other side it shows the concentration of Chinese. On the top is the uh, Old Souk um, from the uh, Dubai Creek, and the other one is international city, which many uh, people um, probably have heard. It's the largest the Chinese commodity center outside China, right? So the distribution of clinic in the UAE, and then as you can see, uh, most of them are in Dubai and some of them in Abu Dhabi, other Emirates, uh, it's uh, quite difficult to find them. Um, so this is a map to show you the location of um, the clinics along and the most, um, uh, vibrant business um, stripe in Dubai. So as you can see along um, uh, on Jumeirah, Sheikh Zayed Road, you'll be able to find many of them. And then that has integrated um, this Chinese traditional medicine clinics to the mainstream medical landscape in Dubai to some extent. Uh, this is another map showing you uh, the location of those clinics in Jumeirah, Business Bay, Dubai Creek areas. I don't have time to go through every single uh, map to show you the specific uh, neighborhoods and then the costs and then the price of real estate. But from the perspective of urban sociology, this has become something quite interesting to explore the connection between Chinese traditional medicine, the mainstream medical landscape, and then the real estate price and then customers and then suppliers. Now, uh, the last minute, I do want to bring about uh, this most important thing, religion. Uh, if I don't speak up the, about religion, I won't be able to leave this place with a clean conscience, right? There are two things about religion. Obviously, Chinese traditional medicine has to do with Chinese philosophy, lifestyle. So it's everything about traditional Chinese medicine has to do with religion. So the integration, spatial integration of these clinics 
in the mainstream medical landscape in the UAE um, provides a glimpse for the residents in the region to understand um, some part of Chinese philosophy, probably, you know, um, to, uh, uh, to, to become more accepting, uh, accepting of the Chinese practices. And then the second, the last one has to do with the Chinese Hui medicine. Um, the particular branch of practices that are informed by uh, Islamic um, beliefs, practices, rituals, right? And there are many more um, people who are Muslim um, practitioners in medicine, but then there are only two uh, specific Chinese way medical practitioners. And in my future research, I'd like, like to explore more uh, toward that direction. So with that, I'm going to close my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. Wonderful. Thank you very much, uh, Yuting, for that. Uh, okay, now please let's in, let's uh, welcome uh, Dr. Jacqueline Armijo to the to the stage, the verbal stage, uh, where she'll be talking to us about high Han Chinese conversion to Islam in Dubai, unexpected consequences of global China encountering cosmopolitan Islam. functioning. As a result, I am incredibly dizzy. I can't look up or down without getting nauseous, so I can't use any notes. But I have clippers, and I'm going to try to fix it. I think we're fixed for now. So much for that. So, um, a little bit of background. This is a side project of my main research, which has to do with sort of all dimensions of Muslims in China. Um, historically, in terms of the spread of Islam in China, it survived um, for a variety of reasons over the centuries, but what it did not do was proselytize. There's no actual history of prosel proselytization of Islam um, in China. Normally, what would happen is people would convert for reasons of marriage, and often um, Chinese Muslim families would adopt children that had been abandoned by, by Han Chinese. So in terms of the spread of Islam within China, those were um, the main venues. The first time I encountered somebody who had converted to Islam in China, I was doing field work in, in Yunnan, and I was visiting a, um, a girls' school. And I was interviewing you know, the teachers and the, the female students. It was in a very poor region of uh, Yunnan. It's, it's Jiaotong, which is at that point one of the poorest counties in all of China. And I'll never forget, I was just you know, walking through this village and these two little girls came up and they were like tugging on my hand. And they said, you know, well, what's your Jin Jiaoda? And I was like, huh? As all of you, people you know who speak Chinese, like there's so many homonyms, like you, know, some, you can hear something and you think, okay, I must have misunderstood. And so then I realized that they, what they were saying is we've entered the religion, and I was like, whoa, <laughs> I was like, really? I'm like, need about my mama. I mean, like, did your parents agree to this? I was just shocked. And they said, well, and they, and I was just sort of like, and why? And, and they both told stories about in their very poor villages, having neighbors who were Muslim women. Um, I think in both cases, they might have been teachers also, who they just really admired. So I just thought this was a one-off. So many years later, um, when I was actually already based in the Gulf, but doing uh, field work in Iwul among the, the Chinese Muslims there, but also the, the Arab merchants who had settled in Iwul, during an Eid festival, um, there's a lot of booths that had been set up outside the, the large mosque in Iwul that had been built. And one of the people selling one of the guys was selling a lot of books, a lot of books about different aspects of Islam in China. 
And so we started to chat and he asked me like who I was and what I was doing. And I said, I, you know, I, I researched Muslims in China. And he's like, well, you should research me. And I'm like, okay, why? And he's like, okay, because I'm a convert. And I was just like, wow, that's surprising. But no, <laughs> because again, I figured like, this is just a, a one-off. I mean, this is just like, this isn't, this isn't a thing. Anyway, I ended up based in the Gulf for 13 years. And it was an interesting time because I was able to sort of document and see from 2000, I was there from 2003 to 2016, the, the growing rise of um, China's relations and the, so many different dimensions of China's relations in the Gulf. And, you know, after doing a lot of interviews with Chinese Muslims in Dubai, I started meeting um, Chinese Muslims who were also converts. And one of the things that people would mention is for them, Islam had come to represent a certain cosmopolitanism. Now, historically, as we all know from our students, they think being modern means being Western, which is very annoying. <laughs> but what I think is so interesting is that among, and this is the, what's interesting is that another Hui uh, scholar has done research in China on converts, and then somebody else has done research um, tangentially on converts in Qinghai. But all these, these other studies found the same thing. When these Han Chinese were asked what attracted to them, about Islam, they said basically it was cosmopolitan, it was international, it was the future. So not, not something I would expect. So right now I'm gonna run through a bunch of images of basically the Chinese Muslim community and the and in, in Dubai, but also ways in which you can see how at this moment in time, if you are a Chinese person living in the UAE, and if you are somebody based in the UAE thinking about the role of China, things are really changing and they're changing very fast and attitudes are changing. And it's really interesting to see this dynamic in which these um, relations are growing and the West is sort of like tangential, like it's almost, it's almost irrelevant. So this is gonna be a, a, a lot of images and we'll see how this goes. These are some of the topics I'm, I'm hoping to cover. I'm just gonna go through this very quickly. Oh, so one of the first, there's just two infrastructure projects I'm gonna mention right off the bat because they really did change people's attitudes. Um, China built a relatively short pipeline, but a very important pipeline because it meant they could get oil from the main um, production on the Persian Gulf to the Arabian Sea avoiding the Strait of Hormuz. And for anybody who studies geopolitics, you understand the Strait of Hormuz is crucial and it's very vulnerable. This is the actual. And the other thing about this is before then, most of the Chinese, the, well, there weren't that many, but the, the ones that were in China, in UAE back then were workers. And this was a major project. And I think this was the first time you had a, a large number of like um, executives engineers, people who, you know, were of, you know, much sort of higher station. The other very important project wasn't in the UAE. Um, and somebody was talking about uh, infrastructure projects as a form of proselytization. Well, if this is a form of proselytization, then, oh my God, China's the biggest proselytizer of Islam ever. Because as part of, when people think, what, what people who don't know much about Islam, what little they might know is like Mecca, you go, you go around the, the Kaaba, that's it. Well, no, actually it's a bit more complicated than that. And you've got to go to these different areas. It's 21 kilometers altogether. In the past, people went by bus, image on the right. Um, that was not very effective. It was like people obviously got stuck in these huge traffic jams, incredible you know, source of pollution, et cetera. The Chinese built a metro system. It made a huge difference. Um, and people's attitude towards what China was capable of just changed literally overnight. And what's interesting is that if you're a Gulf Arab, for Gulf Arabs, they tend to um, go on Hajj, not a once in a lifetime thing, but maybe every few years thing. So for the Gulf Arabs, they very you know, soon experienced what a difference this made. It obviously had a big impression on, I mean, all the Muslims, regardless of where you were from, who were, take, who were using the system. And you can see how it made a big impact. I gotta stop moving back and forth. Um, there are so many different dimensions of all sorts of different projects China is working on with the UAE, but for some reason, this is one of my favorites, and in, in, in part because it involves a very famous um, Chinese botanist who's recently passed away. The whole idea, like when you first read this, like who needs saline rice? Well, yeah, actually saline rice is a pretty good idea. Um, and this 
has been successful and they're now starting it in terms of mass production. And, you know, you can imagine a country, for example, like Bangladesh, uh, or there's all sorts of countries that, which would benefit tremendously in terms of food security. This is really important. Uh, this is an example of sort of popular culture. Like here we have the Burj Al Arab, which used to be one of the most famous hotels in the world. You have Roger Federer and you have the Chinese New Year being celebrated by it being imposed. Now, the new version of that is um, Burj Khalifa, which is now the tallest building in the world. And it was interesting how quickly it became a way to talk to, to share all sorts of eight things. But one of the first ones that happened that sort of struck a note was when um, there was the massacre in the mosque in New Zealand. And there was this iconic image of Jacinda Ardern, which was then projected on this building. Now, this was what was projected on this building at the outbreak of COVID. And I'm sorry, but if you're a Chinese person and you're living in Dubai and you, you, you know, the whole world is like coming down on China, like, oh my God, what have they done? Da, 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 da. And here you have in Dubai, this instead. I mean, this, this, this is powerful. I mean, I don't know who, who was in charge of this, but this was a good idea. And it meant a lot to a lot of people. Um, it's basically Wuhan Jiaoyo. It's like, in other words, like we're with you. Like, um, Dragon Mart. Um, I've already, there's already been mentioned of Dragon Mart. Dragon Mart is massive. It started off relatively small and grew very quickly. It is literally the largest retail center outside. And in this particular paper, it's important because it was one of the uh, most important conduits for large numbers of Chinese being able to move to Dubai and get work visas, not just as business owners, but also as workers. So I did a lot of early interviews there. This just gives you an idea of the range of products that are available and how it expanded. Um, from very early on, again, the, 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 the local government together with Chinese officials realized the extent to which you could do soft power. So there was these were some great photographs. This is Sheikh Zayed. This is you know classic Joe in line with Yasser Arafat, you know, the Saudis. But it gives you an idea of using a business space as a way to educate about the historic ties between China and the Middle East. So tucked away was this Chinese Islamic Center, which originally offered services for Chinese needing, for example, you know, Arabic translation, but then also for Arab speakers who, you know, didn't, um, didn't speak Chinese. And it was mostly staffed by Chinese Muslims who had studied overseas. So one of the projects I'd done earlier was looking at the revival of Islamic education in China, and then I would follow and interview Chinese Muslims who went to study in places like um, Abu Nur in Damascus or Al-Azhar in Egypt and places like that. This is um, a group of um, important officials, including the, the man who became the Imam of the mosque I'm gonna talk about momentarily, but one of the things I wanna mention about this particular group is that um, one of the things I'm arguing is that in a way, the Chinese who, the Han Chinese who converted to Islam have become what I would call the middlemen of the middlemen. Because in the past, the Hui were known for being the middlemen. They were the ones who, because of their, their, their knowledge of the culture and their knowledge of Arabic, were able to facilitate. I like this particular one because it's done by a very famous Hui calligrapher and it says, um, we are all the sons of Adam. So the, one of the main organizations that provides religious instruction and Arabic instruction is this, um, this organization called Kalima. And they had Arabic classes and also Chinese language classes. And this is the school where they used to, um, a public school that they would use on the weekends for these classes. And it was a really important activity because all sorts of different people would come and they wanted to take Islamic studies classes, they wanted to do Chinese language classes, and they wanted to do Arabic language classes. But it was a way in which both the Chinese Muslim community and the Han Chinese community would get together on the weekends for different reasons. Um, I happened to sit down on one of the Arabic classes. And it was in one of the, it was actually when I was in the middle of this class that somebody announced that she had just told her family that she was going, she decided to convert to Islam. And what I thought was, what I thought was interesting is that one of the first questions of somebody else in the class was like, 
so what did you do about all the pork in your in your house and she said yeah I threw it all away and my family was really pissed but you know it, it'll be fine but it was it was interesting sort of how lighthearted this was but you know when it comes to throwing a lot of pork that's 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 a serious issue but what's the other thing about if you are if you are a Han Chinese and you are going to convert to Islam in Dubai, it's quite different than if you are a Chinese person choosing to convert in Indonesia. And for those of you who know that situation, it's like you are, you know, there's a good chance you're going to be ostracized. It's a good chance you, like, your life is going to be made, um, could potentially be made very difficult for you. But obviously in, in Dubai, that's not the case. This organization also, I happened to be there when there was this summit, and it was interesting because the Chinese, um, the Chinese Islamic portion of this was also with Amharic, and then the, um, the English was mostly geared towards those recent Filipino converts. But what was interesting about the, this one is that there was, there was two speakers. There was somebody who had, was Hui, who had um, studied overseas and had actually gone to a, a Sufi um, col um, Islamic college and had a very inclusive understanding of Islam. And then there was a famous imam from China. And the audience was theoretically people who were new Muslims. Though in this case, it was like partially new Muslims and partially just Chinese Muslims. But what was so interesting is that the person from China, of course, if you're a Muslim in China and if you're an imam who's only spent time in China, you have no idea how to talk to converts because you've never probably really met any converts. Whereas the one who had studied overseas had, um, I don't know if it was just a natural, it was a, I mean, a combination of a natural ability but also um, his experience was able, he was able to talk about Islam in a way that was very inviting and very inclusive. Um, as Yuting already mentioned, the UAE is incredibly diverse. The UAE is not just incredibly, it is simply the most diverse country in the world. Um, that's a list of all the countries that are, you know, one minute, okay. And within the expat population, what's interesting, China is now at number nine. So that's that's there's more Chinese than there are British than there are Americans and there are pretty much any any European. So on the one hand, it's number nine. It's it's uh, it's growing fast. Here's just some of the other countries. I'm not going to be able to talk about that or that. But one of the things that's interesting long term, I think there'll be more and more Chinese moving to Dubai, in part because the Chinese government has set aside um, resources and has authorized the first overseas. Chinese school in the world was just opened in Dubai a couple of year, years ago. And it's, it's um, affiliations with Hangzhou. And it is um, the Ministry of Education in China has, you know, has basically licensed it. There's also a Chinese language project. So, that, so the, at the same time, Chinese see how the Emiratis are investing a lot in terms of learning Chinese. This is, this is the mosque. I tried to convince them to make it a Chinese style mosque. They did not agree at all. In fact, they laughed at me and they said, and what? Like, and people show up thinking it's a Buddhist temple. What are we going to tell them? And I'm like, well, will you at least set aside space for like a little museum or something? But what I think is great is that they named it the Fa Fang Qing Zheng Si, which is a, a play on historically the Fan Fang. <laughs> so the foreigners would have to live in, in um, the foreign, foreigners in general, but especially the, um, what's more well documented is the historic, like the, the Arab merchants, who were living in places like in Chang'an or in Tranjo, they would live in separate districts. It was called the Fanfang, which is where the foreign, that's the foreign section. So they called their mosque the, the, the Chinese section mosque, which I thought was, was pretty clever. Uh, this is more about the center there. At least they put something about the history of the different mosques in China, which now you can see which ones they've had to change. But anyway, um, that's, okay, I'll end with that. Uh, celebration of Ramadan, the Chinese consulate. Okay, that's it. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you very much, Jacqueline. Uh, if I can invite Yu Ting to also come up and, and take a seat here, uh, and we'll have comments and remarks and uh, insights and uh, general enlightenment from Professor Nanlai Kao. So please uh, welcome Professor. Hell. Okay. All right, so uh, uh, 
well, thanks for the two wonderful papers. I ha I've already enjoyed reading uh, Jackie and uh, Yu Ching's papers because uh, we have worked together on an edited book project called Chinese Regions Going Global, which was published uh, two years ago in, by Brio. So I think your work always fills uh, a gap in our knowledge about the Chinese presence in Dubai and in the, in the Gulf region. And actually, I think, uh, because I'm not an expert on, I'm, I'm an anthropologist of Chinese Christianity, I'm not an expert on uh, either Muslims or the Gulf region. Uh, but I think I, I would like to say something general because, uh, you know, in the official Chinese discourse of Belt and Road, religion is really uh, listed as, uh, you know, uh, a risk factor, so-called religious risk, uh, uh, but also in, in, the, in, the, in the much of the Western world, I think, Belt and Road is stigmatized, you know, it's also listed as a, as a risk factor. So I was actually, just something personal, I was an uh, exchange coordinator at the Chinese University before, and uh, we were talking about proposing a student exchange program with uh, our partner uh, schools in Europe under the One Belt Knowledge, One Belt, One Road. But I really met object objections before they said, no One Belt, One Road, it's, uh, this is very controversial now. <laughs> EU relations. So I think I'm, I'm glad that this uh, congratulation to uh, David and his team, we can just bring together these two highly politicized issues, you know, one, one conference. And also I strongly agree with uh, this uh, notion. I think both papers uh, come out with a uh, notion of cosmopolitan Islam. I think that's what I really, I strongly agree because uh, I have actually, I did some field work in Dubai that's uh, a decade ago with the uh, RGC grant and uh, among those Christian, Chinese Christian traders, uh, merchants in, uh, you know, Mushi Bada, I don't know the Chinese, uh, the English word. But and, uh, uh, so I, I really, I think that this is the cosmopolitan image of Islam really appeals to ordinary Chinese visitors and, and, and tourists as well. So I think your paper, uh, the, the two papers uh, together, they really contribute to, uh, to uh, debunking this uh, stereotypical image of uh, Islam. And, uh, and also showcase the cosmopolitan image of uh, you know, Dubai. And also uh, it's very harmonious picture <laughs> about how this uh, you know, religion can contribute to this people-to-people uh, -to -people exchange and also even uh, improve the bilateral relationship between uh, China and U UAE. So just start with uh, Jackie. I think my, my question for Jackie is, uh, so how big is the population of Han, uh, Han Chinese converts uh, Han Chinese uh, converts in in in, uh, in Dubai. So maybe this is this uh, this question sounds uh, stupid, but but I just want to estimate because I don't I want to know the scope of this uh, phenomenon. And if marriage, as in, as you mentioned, marriage is an important reason for convert for Han uh, Chinese conversion. Then how many uh, can you can you can you have any statistic about this kind of mixed uh, uh, blended ma uh, marriage in uh, taking place each year in Dubai? And also some demographic information would be great. Um, and, and, and also I like this term, uh, middleman's middleman, uh, middleman for middleman. Um, so how this middleman's middleman, this is Han Chinese converts negotiate their ethnic and religious identities. And uh, do they consider themselves like uh, the more Muslim they, they go, the, the less Chinese they would become. Uh, because uh, you know, in the Chinese uh, contracts, especially the Chinese state does not consider Han Chinese, uh, uh, Han, Han converts as, uh, as, uh, as, uh, as, uh, as, you know, as, uh, as a Muslim, <laughs> so especially in the funeral arrangement, right? So, uh, so this is really a, um, a how they reconcile this ethnic and the religious identities, and is this is a case of ethnic assimilation, or it's just a, uh, or, or religious assimilation, and uh, also for the for the uh, uh, for uh, Muslim, how. Uh, they, they seem they, they don't they don't seem to personalize personalize uh, except through uh, marriage. So this kind of special uh, religious and ethnic dynamics, I think, may also affect how Chinese Muslims uh, personalize, personalize in, in China and the Chinese diaspora. So I think it would be good, it would be good to have a more uh, underground uh, a detailed story told by those uh, research participants and uh, uh, such as those uh, Han uh, about about their the Han conversions. Uh, Yuting's paper, I think, provides a fascinating mapping of the presence of the TCM, the traditional Chinese medicine in the urban la uh, medical la uh, landscape of UAE, as well as, well as uh, an overview of different types of TCM facilities, uh, either uh, 
uh, belonging to the medical or non-medical so-called duty uh, sectors. Um, also, it shows vividly how Belt and Road has facilitated the flow of Chinese medical resources and medical professionals uh, from China to the Gulf region. Uh, since medicines are highly regulated almost uh, every, everywhere in the world, so, uh, so state policy must play an important part in shaping the perception of this uh, Chinese medicine and uh, uh, med medical uh, techniques. So I presume uh, this is, must, must be a veto, the, the, the legal and the political framework must be a veto to this uh, so-called uh, health-related uh, belt and road. Uh, so I would like to know more about the relevant uh, legal and political framework in the UAE regarding uh, the governance of uh, medicine. And uh, uh, so, of course, we need to go beyond the geopolitical, uh, geopolitics, uh, the geopolitical dimension of Belt and Road, but also I think we need to uh, take into account uh, not to, uh, not to uh, overlook the importance, the structural influence of these geopolitical uh, contacts, um, especially uh, when it comes to this uh, China uh, Gulf relations. Um, actually, uh, to just to put, uh, put Yijun's case in a more globally uh, comparative uh, framework, I think the, the smooth uh, China EOE relations actually contrast sharply with the, uh, the very conflicting China and EU relations. Uh, because I, done, I, I did uh, some of the research in, among the Chinese Christians in, 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 in uh, Italy and France. So I can I just give you a kind of uh, a comparative uh, reference. Uh, so I think the lack of a BR uh, Belt and Road infrastructure in uh, uh, in e uh, European Union may, may have led may have led to the disintegration of the Chinese community from this uh, urban cosmopolitan landscape uh, in Europe. Because in European Union, Chinese medicine, along 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 with many uh, like ethnic uh, food or ethnic vegetables, are considered illegal, are uh, banned by the. Uh, 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 European uh, Union. Uh, so uh, I come. I'm, I come across uh, some Chinese uh, Christians uh, in, in 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 Rome. They hold, they would hold Chinese uh, medicine um, workshop in their church as a way to as a, as a kind of ethnic missionary uh, strategy to reach out to the uh, ethnic uh, Chinese. And uh, and of course they, they have to smuggle those Chinese medicines to to Europe because this is uh, illegal. Uh, so I think this is really a good uh, comparative uh, uh, re uh, reference. And also you, you, you mentioned non-Western civilizations show more tolerance to such traditional uh, bodily practices, a holistic healthcare approach and, and this kind of non-biocentric techniques. I think this is really a, 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 a point uh, which is uh, uh, well taken. Uh, so besides spatial analysis, I, uh, I was wondering what, what are the main stakeholders uh, promoting this uh, health uh, Silk Road, uh, this health collaboration between the two countries. Mm, another thing is, uh, is, are there any kind of Arab, Arab uh, doctors who study Chinese medicines in China and then return to UAE to work uh, as a practice uh, Chinese medicine? Um, and just like the Chinese missionary uh, uh, movement in Africa, uh, as, uh, uh, last uh, yesterday's panel, I think the health uh, belt and road is primarily a global Chinese uh, uh, culture, uh, uh, global Chinese uh, culture phenomenon. Like Chinese doctors serving uh, Chinese uh, patients uh, with the uh, Mandarin Chinese as the main uh, uh, as the sole medium of communication. Um, so uh, I think what is missing, what seems to be missing in, in those papers, is the local response to this. Uh, to the Chinese, uh, either the, the Hui, uh, the Han uh, converts and the uh, Chinese uh, uh, medicines. Uh, and, uh, and how did local people treat this ambiguous, uh, so-called li, li Liao practice? Like, uh, so it's, it's kind of very ambiguous uh, uh, physical therapy, like neither medical nor, it's between medical and, uh, and, build, and, and, and uh, life cultivation uh, kind of uh, practice. So, uh, mm, also, would you agree that this uh, can be viewed as part of the China's soft power project uh, like by uh, Chinese government? And how would this official framework affect the way uh, TCM is understood and experienced by the local Arab people? Mm, and uh, I think uh, just some, these are just some random um, questions and random thoughts. And uh, uh, I think, Maybe because 
the, the lack of attention may be because of the, re the, the result of the small population, the small Chinese population um, uh, in uh, Chinese Muslim in, in Dubai. Uh, because uh, as one of you knows, like most Chinese came to Dubai for, for uh, you know, the, for, for not religious reasons, but for uh, economic reasons, business reasons. So would you consider like religion, it's a, it's a kind of secondary phenomenon in China's engagement with the uh, Gulf region. Uh, because when I, when, uh, this, this is a religion studies, a religion conference. So we, uh, we, we have created a conference zone, but when they reach out to like political scientists or economists, they will always say, a religion is not, it's not that significant. It's just a kind of secondary phenomenon. So I think this is, this is, this is what has puzzled me for a long time. Uh, a long time. So I, I would like to also ask you kind of go back. Thank you, I will stop here. Wonderful, uh, thank you very much Nan Lai for those um, responses. Uh, well, sorry for those comments. Uh, we've got just under 30 minutes, about 25 minutes for discussion. Uh, maybe we can start by inviting uh, Yu Ting and Jacqueline to respond to, to Nan Lai's questions and provocations, and then we'll open up the, the floor for questions afterwards. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you, Nan Lai, very much for your uh, questions and your comments. And uh, now I didn't have enough time and to uh, really give you a, a fuller picture about um, the landscape of traditional Chinese medicine in the UAE, um, there's actually a big part in my paper that talks about the history of traditional Chinese medicine. And it's very important actually um, to understand that there are multiple stakeholders in this whole process of development. And then the first Chinese traditional medicine um, practitioners uh, were dispatched by the Chinese Ministry of Health um, from, uh, from two cities primarily, I think from Chengdu and then Henan. Um, and they had cooperation with um, a private hospital in Sharjah, Zahra Hospital, which is a very well-known hospital, has been in the country for a very long time. So that's the beginning, 1981. Um, and then you start seeing this growing uh, clinics and in, uh, established by uh, state-owned enterprises in the UAE who wanted to take care of their own employees. You know, they're on rotation basis, and then they... Uh, you know, they find the Western medicine in many cases very, uh, you know, expensive. <laughs> and so and the traditional Chinese medicine provide affordable uh, alternative um, to these employees and then also something familiar culturally. And so that was, you know, in the 1980s. And 1990s are seeing private um, enterprises being established by um, medical practitioners who didn't want to continue working in China. And then, you know, it was during the wave of, you know, sort of plunging into the commercial sea. And then they also went abroad and then they start exploring opportunities. But most interestingly would be the beginning of the, the, the research um, centers and institutions um, sponsored by the UAE government, by the Sheikh himself. Sheikh Zayed was actually very keen uh, he invested in some of these enterprises. So, um, so the multiple holders um, in you know the, la the, the medical, the traditional Chinese medicine landscape will involve Chinese um, public um, uh, entities, um, state-owned um, enterprises, and it uh, involves hospital in China who is looking to expand their overseas market, and then local um, actors, um, the Emirati. Um, um, elites and um, you know major um, big business you know families and who are looking to expand into healthcare. Health is very important in a global city like Dubai, right? And so this is something that I wanted to bring um, up and and, and and share with you and for this you know to, to enrich this conversation. So um, it's not you know primarily you know um, a private market driving. It's and there's also a lot of top down. Uh, efforts in uh, generating these continuous growth in traditional Chinese medicine in the UAE. I think it is some, something that makes this case quite unique. Um, so this is one. Um, um, and another is, the com in, you know, the, uh, some of these, um, you know, the spatial dimensions and, and 
and, and how how do we think about you know the traditional Chinese medicine its integration with Dubai's medical landscape? Um, now the culture is very important here. Dubai, why it has most Chinese traditional medicine clinics? And of course, obviously, it's about uh, you know Dubai's business model. Dubai focus on um, providing diverse um, um, services. No matter it's health services or any other sort of services, education, you know, to its um, hugely diverse population. So, um, the Dubai is not promoting Chinese medicine per se. Dubai is promoting diversity, um, and now, of course, that provides a viable um, market for Chinese traditional medicine clinics and entrepreneurs to enter the market. Uh, so, there's and Dubai does not care if this is you know Indian alternative medicine or Chinese medicine or any sort of you know. Uh, Western medical practices, and then as long as there's abundance of demand in the market, then there has to be supplies, and so that is very essential. Yet, if you look at other Emirates, even in Ajman, which has a huge China market, many Chinese people live in Ajman, it only has one traditional Chinese clinic, um, because the influence of Indian culture is much more uh, rooted in that Emirate, and then Emirate didn't have the intention to really sort of, or maybe didn't have this resources to generate that kind of, you know, market on, or provide infrastructure um, for, you know, these um, enterprises to operate and then to flourish. And so you see this kind of uh, interesting dynamics there. Um, so I will leave this around and let uh, Jackie to respond to some questions and maybe we'll add something more later. Thank you. Oh, I just did want to, I wanted to add one case about um, in, in Qatar. When I was teaching a China class, one of the assignments was they had to go out and find some evidence of, of, of you know, Chinese influence in Qatar. And one of the students interviewed somebody who had set up a traditional Chinese medicine clinic that was very popular in Doha. And it was run by somebody who turns out I knew from when I was a student back in China in the 1980s. He was from the Sudan originally, not the Sudanese I married, another, another Sudanese guy went to medical school there. But anyway, when um, the students were, the foreign students finished medical training in China, they were this is in the 70s and 80s, they were given an option of staying on for three months to do an intensive Chinese, traditional Chinese medicine. And a lot of them chose that. Anyway, so he had set up several um, clinics that were very popular in Doha. And one of the reasons they were popular is because something called moxibustion or tuina or um, cupping has a precedent within the Islamic traditions considered sunnah. is something that the Prophet Muhammad mentioned. So that was one, you know, so here you have somebody who went to medical school in China, is, you know, native speaker of Arabic, is living in the Gulf and is able to readily introduce something. So going back to the numbers, um, I was talking to somebody recently, we estimated in terms of the Han Chinese who had converted, who are part of one of the networks I'd mentioned, um, either the, the classes or the organization associated with the mosque, somewhere between 750 and 1,000. But for example, if you're somebody who converted because of marriage, right, then you may not have had necessarily any, any, any interaction with either of these groups, depending on the circumstances of how you met somebody. So in that sense, I, you know, in terms of the total number, I have no idea. But in terms of the ones affiliated with the two, two networks I mentioned, I would estimate between 750 and 1,000. Well, that's, that's, there's between like 300,000 and 400,000 Chinese in Dubai, so maybe not so much. Was there another question? Okay, let's uh, maybe open it up to the floor. So we have Alvin and then Emily. Uh, if you do have a question, please put it up. Okay, well, uh, thank you both for your presentations. I have a question for Jacqueline, or is it, uh, I can see, Jackie. <laughs> um, so um, I was really interested in your comment about soft power, and I wonder if you can expand on it more, specifically in Dubai and Qatar, the, like your cases. Mm -hmm. And I find it really interesting because if you look at any large-scale quantitative data set on Chinese soft power or Chinese influence in either Sub-Saharan Africa or let's say Southeast Asia, it's actually been going to the negative. Like A data, I'm sorry, A data, Afrobarometer has been like showing that uh, the long-term trends are sort of the short-term trends for Chinese influence in Africa has been a bit more negative. The same with used data in Southeast Asia. And I guess I wonder what makes like the case of Qatar and Dubai different, number one. Number two, um, do, you see this, uh, the, do you see the religious aspect to be some sort of like a special mechanism for sort of like the media, the, 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 the diffusion of soft power. Because the, the, the main issue, the, what the literature is saying about Africa and Southeast Asia, the, the main reason why soft power is not like working in 
in both in, bo in both places is because soft power by definition is non-material whereas like chinese influence in both like both both places are mediated by uh, development finance or direct investments which are e at best temporary or um very transactional thank you maybe sorry jack maybe we'll just take a couple more questions first uh, thank you for these um, really interesting presentations. Um, I have just some like little technical questions um, specifically about traditional Chinese medicine um, uh, in the Gulf. Um, when you're talking about this moment in 1981, when uh, traditional Chinese medicine doctors were sent um, to the area, was that also a time when people would have been, doctors would have been sent to lots of other places? And so that's kind of an interesting little moment in history. And I wonder what that was all about and what like how that was that was envisioned um on the chinese side and then what that has led to in different kinds of places so i, I just i think it would be interesting if you could kind of contextualize this in that history and then um i was also just wondering if you take chinese medicine um or tcm clinics in dubai and you look at say you compare with say other kinds of clinics uh, maybe massage therapy. Now, I'm not trying to say that these are in any way related, but like um, massage therapy or even like beauty clinics or plastic surgery, like where does it exist in that kind of landscape? Because you said that this is sort of like a service model, like this is like a place to provide services. And so the related question is how many of the users of these are tourists? Is it a tourist market? Or to what extent is it actually uh, like a local market? And then related to that question is, um, is TCM covered by medical insurance plans, right? And that's a big question. I know in Canada, it uh, often is now, can be. So that's, you know, so it's about how how something becomes legitimate, right, in the med in the medical system. Um, yeah, I think that's it for now. Oh, I had one other question. Um, sorry for Jackie. Um, in terms of the interactions between uh, Han Muslim converts in Dubai, this was in Dubai, right? Um, and their, their interactions with other um, Muslims in the other migrant community groups that are that have Muslims, right? So people from Indonesia, people from Bangladesh, people from India. Is there any? Is there much interaction? I have two questions. Uh, first, to uh, Wu Ping, uh, Western medicine, when it comes, it doesn't come as a rival. It, it is like a monotheism which denies all other practices of medicine any legitimacy. Ontologically speaking, epistemologically speaking, it is a superior, it claims, uh, a practice of, of medicine. That's why, for example, in a place like Turkey, uh, doctors were the most modernist uh, sectors of the society, denying all the traditional medicine any legitimacy, even claiming that it's superstitious, it should be dropped and so on and so forth. Not in way in the doctor association is the most vocal opposition to Erdogan right now in Turkey. I am wondering how, uh, both in the case of China and in the case of Dubai, how these two very not rival, hostile, it should be, uh, in terms of ontology, in terms of epistemology, practice of medicine, survive together? I mean, how do they view each other? Do they see each other as complementary or it's just silence about like what the other side is, is doing and how the Dubai government is resolving this very scientific uh, uh, conflict? Uh, it's my first to, about Jackie, you are familiar that the, you know, Dubai is very pluralistic, but it is not it doesn't mean that the government doesn't have any view of what Islam is. In the last 20 years, the UAE government is waging a, a campaign against Muslim Brotherhood, denying it any religious legitimacy, and to the, came to the point of declaring it as a terrorist organization, right? So I am wondering about the, the people who are teaching religion in, in Dubai to the Chinese, what kind of Islam they are they are preaching, and then are they really careful of not to touch about like this political Islam? You know, Islam. Uh, what kind of Islam is that? It is Salafi. It is. It cannot be Salafi, even though they have relations with Saudi Arabia. UAE is as hostile to Salafism as as Turkey is. 
so I am wondering about the content of the teaching, like in terms of theology, in terms of jurisprudence, what is it that they are they are teaching there? Um, to our panelists, how's your memory capacity? Oh, no, it's, it's gone. Okay, but okay. So do you, want to, do you want to respond to those three first, and then we'll hear from David. I can't take notes, so like, it's just... Yeah. Um, you're not going to ask anything, right? <laughs> so I'm, gonna, I'm just going to go backwards, like, hopefully remember. Um, one of the interesting ways in which the, the Han Chinese converts and the Chinese Muslim um, community interacts with the very international... Muslim community in Dubai is at this, for example, at this at this new Chinese mosque. Um, it's right there at International City. Um, most it's a you know International City isn't, isn't sort of like lower middle class you know middle class housing basically. And in that area, in that neighborhood, it's mostly from South Asia. And so now during Ramadan, right, um, they organize these massive iftars, serving hundreds every night, and it's all basically Chinese Muslim food. So I just love the idea. And people are like, wow, like this is something different. So you've got, but um, I did a comparison with other um, convert communities. And one of the things that they say is actively taking part in these uh, Islamic charitable activities. Because they also, there's, they're very well organized in terms of donations for, you know, poor communities, donations or, you know, communities that have suffered like, you know, the, the earthquake in Turkey and Syria. Or in other words, there's all sorts of charitable activities that the Chinese Muslims and the new Chinese Muslims can actively take part in, in which they work together with, you know, this sort of international Muslim community to the benefit of a, a range of people. Okay, so that one. Viral. You're gonna to have to remind me. I was. I, oh, 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 oh. Okay, okay. All right. So, so I have not. Okay, let's put it this way. What, what I, the, the in terms of, the, the like the sermons basically I have listened to. They are. I'm, I'm talking about one particular imam. I, in terms of my conversations with the imam at the mosque, that's a different story. <laughs> But in terms of my conversations with a person who, oh, I think is playing the most important role in terms of um, introducing Islam to not only Chinese, but to other people as well. It is, you know, you, have you heard of Kaftaru, who was the, he was a Sufi leader of the, uh, the, the, the college was in Damascus and it's called Abu Nuwad. But anyway, it is Islam as fundamentally inclusive islam as not judgmental it's not, like like i've never heard this particular mom tell anybody you know they were going to burn an eternal hellfire <laughs> i have i mean in other words it's all about islam being a way not even only the way but a way to you know to respect others to it just sort of be in the world as benignly as possible. It is It is completely, I mean, I've never heard, I'm sure there are Salafi Chinese Muslims in Dubai, but I've just never encountered any of them. But I think it's an, it's interesting that this particular person, I think one of the reasons he has such a stature is because he's able to talk about Islam in a way that is not threatening to people, to anybody. Um, and then the question about Chinese and soft power. I, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, it's a really interesting question because from my point of view, it seems like when Chinese try to do soft power, it tends to fail. But when they do it inadvertently, like, damn, like that Mecca Metro, I mean, like, right? I mean, in terms of soft power, seriously, like, what, g g give me an example of anything, right, that compares to that. So it's, 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 you know, I, but I think I'm assuming that they are learning their lessons along the way, but it would have been so interesting to, to sit in on conversations like, did, did, the, did the construction company in charge of this project think, this is going to change how people view China? Right? I don't know. I have no idea, but I think that's a fascinating question. Okay, I think I answered everything else. Um. Okay, so uh, I'm going to try to um, answer some of the questions about traditional Chinese medicine, but because I also happen to have done some 
uh, research on Chinese Muslims, and I'm very <laughs> eager to join this conversation. So I'm going to uh, start with this context. Um, the context is very important. I don't have very um, deep knowledge about um, China's um, um, you know, international aid, um, especially when it comes to medical um, services um, abroad, but I know that uh, when China um, began to re-engage with um, um, the world um, after the Cultural Revolution, and when China began to participate in some of these um, um, initiatives um, um, promoted by global organizations like United Nations, UNDP, and then World um, Health Organization. So uh, it's, it's around that time when Chinese government, Ministry of Health, really start you know, organizing these um, physicians from major hospitals in different regions and to um, join the aid um, uh, team, medical team, to Africa, to our world. And so um, they came to Sharjah, the first team, not to Dubai because Sharjah had more prominent status until you know mid 1980s when Dubai took over. So the first collaboration happened in Sharjah. So that's sort of a, a little context there. Um, now um, the um, uh, the land, the how tr traditional Chinese um, medicine incorporates you know itself into this very diverse medical or semi-medical sort of you know landscape service um, industry in Dubai is something quite interesting. I've, I've tried to do this. Um, uh, spatial analysis. So I have more pictures showing, you know, how they are located and then uh, their neighbors, you know, where do they find the location? Because for business owners, and of course, you know, even if it's just a beauty salon, sort of massage, you know, um, services, and then they have to understand their market, understand their environment and their clientele. And they obviously, you know, seek out um, patrons and through their social network, but then they also, you know, uh, want to at least you know have a presence in a place where where you know uh, it's naturally it can be naturally discovered, right? But so uh, most of these clinics we surveyed and we went to these clinics. Me and my research assistants, we talked to the receptionists, talked to the physician, talked to the owners. There are some very big operations like Tong Ren Tang has a branch in Dubai Healthcare City, um, and you have other smaller operations. But overall, you know you have sixty different of different sizes, and so. They are really um, uh, they, they have a good idea what they are getting into and they're smart smart entrepreneurs they're not just the practitioners and many of them have this you know ambition to really become a um, to become a service provider for diverse population not just Chinese they're also trying to overcome this language barrier right by hiring people who are trained in Western medicine but also have knowledge in Chinese medicine. And you know this is a hugely controversial thing. David is the best expert in this room. Talk about you know all these health issues, right? So in China, Chinese medicine has been criticized as pseudoscience or you know superstition, and there's a lot of controversy there. But then in medical schools in China, you also have you know these uh, you know these these programs that seek to kind of combine those together. So we start we see that um, debate going on in Dubai as well. I think that also addressed the question about you know the relationship between Western medicine, alternative um, treatment. And then I think this is, a, a, of course, you know, very important topic. Um, and it's a little bit out of scope of what I'm trying to do here, but then I, I think it's important to uh, situate this uh, particular project within the much bigger debate about, you know, how, you know, this alternative treatment integrates into this, you know, um, the dominant uh, Western uh, dominant, uh, <laughs> the, the landscape dominant by Western medicine. Uh, insurance, yeah, you know, it's something um, and that has changed throughout time. Do, uh, not just Dubai, UAE government have been very uh, responsive, I would say, especially Ministry of Health, to uh, license various kind of practices. And and even though you know it's a country that um, is relatively young, had a weak bureaucratic system. But then over the last several decades, we start seeing, you know, the country become much more efficient um, and more bureaucratic in a way, but in a good good way as well for business people. So infrastructure being built and then the process become more transparent and it's, there's a lot of institutionalization going on. Um, and and, and th there's a, actually a, a very interesting article looking at the licensing process for traditional uh, Chinese medicine. Uh, so, you know, from 1980s, um, doctors came from China already start pursuing um, certification by taking, you know, um, medical exams administered by the ministry. 
But at the beginning, you know, because they didn't understand how to deal with traditional medicine, so they didn't know how to license them. But then since 1990s, they start doing that. Uh, another question that I mentioned, uh, asked uh, earlier is about, you know, if, are there any local interests in studying Chinese medicine and then practice that, right? Uh, I know um, there was one young lady who unfortunately passed away in a, in a very unfortunate car accident. And she was a very prominent, a very smart Marathi um, woman who studied in China, studied traditional Chinese medicine and then came back to the UAE and then practiced it. Uh, so, you know, you see, but then, um, and of course, you know, there was also a lot of other young Emirati students who try to emulate that and then try to, you know, go to China and then learn. But it's an extremely difficult task to learn traditional Chinese medicine um, in this way. But, but some of these acupuncture programs operate in Canada, North America, you know, in the United States might be able to, uh, you know, um, make, um, make it a little bit, you know, more possible. Uh, easier for um, students in the UAE, Marathi students, especially Arab students who are interested in this and to study Chinese medicine in a slightly different uh, framework. Uh, so uh, because of licensing process, insurance um, policy is catching up. Uh, in Dubai is about business. So insurance companies are not really, you know, uh, um, they, they, they are interested in engaging with all sorts of service providers, right? So I know that um, Acupuncturists, uh, acupuncture clinics, and then there's uh, quite a wide range of um, clinics. They provide a reimbursement form. They still don't have that kind of auto pay system, but um, you can get reimbursed if you don't mind going through the hassle. So, yeah, so it's becoming more mature um, market now. And now because of BRI, because of post COVID uh, collaborations between China and UAE, I, I, I'm positive that, you know, We'll, we'll see more of these kind of enterprises operating. Um, yeah. Um, but and then just, uh, um, I'm going to let David ask, and then maybe I can join that conversation about Chinese medicine. Maybe if I can just intervene here. Thank you very much for those responses. Uh, we are out of time, and as you all know, it's lunchtime. Right? So um, uh, I know David has some questions. If any of you have any other questions for our, our panelists, then please ask them during lunch. Uh, but please join me in thanking them for their, their very insightful presentation. Today.